And we should start seeing some more people. Yep, I see them. Yep, here they come. <laughs> Hello, hi everybody. This is Lisa from the Law Library. We're just gonna wait a couple of minutes to make sure everybody has a chance to get signed on. We did have a really good um, registration number for this class today. And I can see the number growing here as those of you get signed on. So again, we're just gonna wait a couple of minutes to make sure everybody's signed on before we get started. Um, I will go over a couple of housekeeping things while we do that. We are expecting a large attendance today. So although we will be taking questions at the end, we will probably not be able to get to all your questions. So we appreciate your, your understanding with that. Um, one thing I will ask you to do, and I've already posted a note in the chat here, but um, if you do have questions as we go along, will you put them in Q&A? That's where we want the questions to be. So I'll, I'll say that again before we get started. I'd like to see those in Q&A. Um, let's see, please keep in mind this is gonna be a general presentation today and not meant to be individualized legal advice. So do keep that in mind when you are asking or posting any questions. And also um, from the library, I would ask you, when you sign off today, you will see a link to a very short survey that we have posted. We would really appreciate if you would take a minute to take the survey. Um, it really helps us with our class planning and knowing what kind of things we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what people want to see. So if you would just take a minute or so to sign on for the survey uh, at the end, that would be great. We are still just getting the hang of doing webinars here at San Diego Law Library. So we're still learning and we really appreciate any feedback that helps us do better. So I still see the number of participants climbing here. We're just gonna wait a moment and make sure everybody's signed on before we get started. Really appreciate you signing up for our webinar today. Again, we're new new to doing webinars at San Diego Law Library, so we really appreciate the good response we've been receiving. Um, we're trying to pick some good topics and speakers for you, and so far so good, I think. So Aiku, I did see your video disappear here. It's up to you whether you want to have that thumbnail or not. I'm back. I'm back. Okay, I do see someone saying they had some difficulty signing in. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we've had that before. Thanks for letting us know. Uh, give it another minute or so before we get started. Appreciate your patience while we do that. So I think I'll go ahead and just go ahead and introduce our speaker today and then that will hopefully give, uh, give everyone another moment or two to get signed on. So we're really happy today to have Aiku Sano with us today. Um, Aiku is a founding attorney and manager of the Sano and Associates Law Firm here in San Diego County. Um, that firm is uh, focused on trust and estate, asset protection, and corporate law practice. She is active in the North County Bar, was formerly on the Board of Directors and, from 2015 to 2018, and was president of the North County Bar Association in 2018. She is multilingual, multicultural, born in Japan, grew up in Hawaii, She's practiced in New Orleans, Hawaii, and Los Angeles before starting her firm here in San Diego. Licensed to practice in New York, Hawaii, and California. That's very impressive. And she's been a great friend of San Diego Law Library as well, having participated in some of our Know the Law events before. And again, very active in the North County Bar here in San Diego. So I think with that, it is afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started. All right. 
Hello everyone. My name is Iku Girl Sano. Um, I go by Iku for short because Iku Girl is not an easy name to pronounce, I know. I'm Japanese from Hawaii and I'm here to talk to you about estate planning today because that's what I do for a living at Sano & Associates. Uh, first of all, what is estate planning anyway? Let's take a look. Okay, here we are today. If you're watching this, you are alive and hopefully lively. <laughs> so in life, there are things that can happen. Uh, for example, you might get married in the near future. You might get divorced. You might be expecting a child or grandkids, or um, you might be thinking about buying a house, whether it's uh, your primary residence or investment property or you could be planning to start your own business. I call them life events. Things can happen in life. Now, estate planning is the planning you do for your future life event. For example, if you're planning to get married, you might want to plan for a prenup. Or if you're already married, you can do a postnup. And if you're maybe thinking about divorce, you might want to consider having a marital settlement agreement in case of divorce, right? Um, if you're expecting a child and you want the financial stability for the future, you might purchase a life insurance. All of that is part of estate planning. Now, in life, there are life events that are not planned for, or you don't want them to happen, but it could happen. Uh, such as accidents. It could happen to people of all ages. Doesn't matter who you are or how much you have. It could happen to anyone. Uh, illness like dementia, Alzheimer, um, cancer, and most recently COVID-19. Nobody planned for getting sick, but things could happen in your life. You just never know. Um, estate planning, you can plan for these unexpected life events as well. Today, in this seminar, I'm going to focus on estate planning, uh, planning that you can do in case of unexpected and unwanted life event, such as accidents and illness. Um, we're going to specifically talk about advanced healthcare directives, durable power of attorney, wills, and trust. Now, when is a good time to actually start your planning? Well, I think now is a great time to start planning because think about it, if you're dead, you can't write your own will, right? Um, estate planning is something that you do while you're living and lively. Unfortunately, in the past, few weeks. I've had a few calls from people who are impacted by COVID-19. Most recently, I had a call from a gentleman uh, who said his father is in the hospital fighting COVID-19. Uh, the father is in, is in his mid-50s, so still young, uh, owns business and owns several investment properties, but the son thinks that um, the father would not make it through. So the son asked me, what can we do? We need my father's estate plan now. Unfortunately, though, in that case, um, I have to tell the son, I'm sorry, it's too late. There's nothing we can do to help your father because the father was um, in the hospital and he was not able to um, speak to me on the phone. He was not able to sign any documents. Basically, he was incapacitated, right? So at that point, it was too late to do estate planning because planning is something you do while you can, while you're living and lively. Now, our ultimate life event is death. We don't wanna talk about it. We don't wanna think about it. It's not a happy subject, but death is something that will happen to each and every one of us. I mean, today's uh, science and technology, this is something you cannot avoid, unfortunately. We just hope that this death will be later than sooner 
but we just don't know. Um, because we know that it will happen though, we can plan for it. Again, planning is something you do now and things that happen after your death is called the estate administration. Now, this happens, estate administration happens after you're gone. So you're not going to administer your own estate because you're not living anymore. You can't do that. But you can plan ahead for your estate administration. Okay? So today, um, because the time is limited on this webinar, uh, I'm going to focus on planning that you can do for uh, unexpected unplanned, unwanted life events and death. Also, I'm going to talk just a little bit about probate administration uh, because without knowing what probate is, it will be difficult to understand the, the difference between wills and trusts and the need for the trust. So I will talk about probate just a little bit. I've been told that there are a few attorneys uh, watching this live today. Thank you very much. Um, but this seminar is designed for non-professionals. Uh, this is Estate Planning 101. Uh, I will cover the basics of the estate planning, so please bear with me. And if you like more comprehensive um, detail analysis, you're more than welcome to uh, consult with me privately. All right, so let's talk about the first document first legal document that you can plan in advance. This is called the Advanced Healthcare Directive. Now, this document has two parts to it. First part is to name your agent to make healthcare decisions for you. This agent, someone that you appoint, will act for you if you are no longer able to communicate with your doctor and decide which procedure or which surgery or which treatment you want to pursue. If you can no longer communicate with your doctor and make your own healthcare decisions, your agent will make the decision for you. Now, the agent should be someone who's close to you, uh, who knows your personal value. It could be your spouse, it could be your children over the age of 18, it could be um, your siblings, but someone close to you and someone who understands your personal value when it comes to your healthcare decisions. Now, the second part of this document is to state your wishes regarding your healthcare matters, especially the end of life decisions, right? Imagine if you're in a vegetative state, you're in coma and the doctor needs to know whether to you know turn off all the machines so you can die naturally or do you want your heart to be pumped by machine to, to be kept alive well if the doctor asks you what would you like to do if you're in a vegetative state you would not be able to answer the doctor's question right i'm not a doctor but if you're if you can answer you're not in vegetative state um, so the agent, your agent will make that decision for you, but don't let the agent guess what you would want. You want to state your wishes so that your agent can act accordingly and follow your instructions as to end of life decisions. Okay. In some states, the, um, the first part is called the uh, healthcare power of attorney. And the second part, of making uh, medical decisions, I'm sorry, um, the wishes, stating your wishes as to medical uh, matters, it's called the living will. California combines these um, healthcare power of attorney and living will into one document called the Advanced Healthcare Directive. This document uh, um, can serve two purposes of uh, healthcare power of attorney, which you appoint your agent, and to state your wishes as to your medical or healthcare matters. So two in one, all right? The second document that we're going to talk about is durable power of attorney. Well, this document, again, designates and appoints your agent to act for you. But this agent has nothing to do with your healthcare matters. But this agent has everything to do with your money and assets. So 
when you're appointing someone, you want to make sure that this person is someone you can completely rely on and trust because this person is going to have full access to your assets. Um, I have seen some horrible cases and I want to share a few with you. Um, it usually involves um, elderly grandma uh, living alone, no families nearby. And here comes a very nice neighbor who's willing to help the grandma around the house, take her to uh, grocery shopping, take her to bank. And next thing you know, the grandma is very dependent on this neighbor. Uh, it's usually the neighbor or a bus driver. I don't know why, but I have multiple cases involving bus drivers. Um, so eventually the grandma becomes so dependent that um, the grandma names this nice fella as her agent to manage her assets. Next thing you know, this person have full access to the grandma's bank accounts. Um, they can sell her house. In fact, I have one case where uh, this neighbor was acting as an agent and he was basically skimming money off her bank account. But one day he listed her house for sale. Um, that's how I got notified and involved. Uh, but this, this person was trying to sell the grandma's house to his buddy for far less than market, fair market value. Uh, fortunately, we were able to stop that sale. Um, but uh, again, your agent would have full access to your money and assets. So please be careful when you are uh, appointing someone to act as your agent under durable power of attorney. Usually, if you are married, your spouse can be your agent. Your um, child uh, over the age of 18 could be someone, um, could be a friend, but again, has to be someone reliable and trustworthy. If you don't have anyone like that, um, in California, there are licensed uh, professional uh, fiduciaries. These people are licensed professionals called licensed professional fiduciaries, they can be your agent for you. And these people are licensed and bonded. Um, so there are options for you. A lot of times people ask me, uh, but we're married, we're husband and wife, and we own everything jointly. Do we still need this durable power of attorney, even if everything is owned jointly? And my answer is, yeah, you should have one, even if you're married and own everything jointly. Um, and the reason is because I had a case a while ago where um, husband and wife own a uh, property, a home together, and the husband was um, diagnosed with dementia and they wanted to move into an assisted living home together. So they made the arrangement and but they have to sell the house because to, to move into assisted living home it's not cheap, right? So then they needed to sell the house to make funds. Well, they were trying to sell the house owned by husband and wife jointly, but they couldn't uh, proceed with the sale process because, because the house was owned jointly, uh, the escrow required the husband's participation as well. The husband had to sign all the paperwork in order to effectuate the sale. But in this case, the husband was not in, um, uh, in a mental state to sign any documents, uh, they could not sell the house. Just um, on Monday, just two days ago, I got a call from someone, a couple in LA. Um, in this case, the husband called. He was trying to refinance their home mortgage, but the wife uh, has Alzheimer's disease and she cannot sign any documents. And he wanted to know, what can I do? Because um, escrow requires uh, that both husband and wife sign all the paperwork and the wife cannot sign. Um, well, I asked, do you have durable power of attorney? Because if they do, the husband can sign his own signature and he can also sign wife's signature as her power of attorney agent. In this case, um, in both scenarios, they did not have this document, so they could not, uh, the first one could not sell the house. The second one, um, I don't think he can refinance. Um, I suggested that perhaps a conservatorship is an option, but it's a, 
court process that takes time and money. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen, but again, I could not help them. So husband and wife, even if you own everything jointly, yes, you should have this document durable power of attorney. Now the agent's power and authority uh, terminates upon your death, upon principal's death. Think about it. If you're an agent acting for someone and if that someone is gone, who do you act for? There's nobody to act for. So then the agent's um, powers and authority terminates upon the principal's death. And I'll give you an example. Um, I had a grandma who um, had this power of attorney document uh, and appointed an agent to sell her house. Uh, this is, I'm sorry. In December of 2017, uh, grandma wanted to move into an assisted living home. So she asked her agent to find a suitable um, assisted living home, do all the paperwork so that the grandma can move in. And the agent did, no problem. And again, um, the grandma asked the agent to sell her home so she has funds to pay um, to the assisted living home. So the agent started the sale process. She listed the house for sale, and that was December of 2017. Uh, just a few weeks later, in January 2018, the grandma died. Um, at that point, this agent has just found a potential buyer, and she, the agent was about to start the sale process. Well, unfortunately, because the grandma died, the agent's power and authority to sell the house terminated. So what happens after the grandma's gone? Well, it's the estate administration, right? Things that happen after your death is called estate administration. Now, before we talk about estate administration, I like to talk about the third legal document um, called a will. Uh, you might be familiar with this document. Um, it's a legal document that contains your instruction and wishes as to what should be done with your money and property after your death. Basically, it's the document that says who gets what after, you, um, after you're gone, right? Also, this document nominates an executor. Executor is someone who administers your estate for you because you're gone. Now, take a look, it's a nomination. You can nominate your own executor in your will, but the court appoints the executor. So what do you mean, do I have to go to court? Yes, you do. If, if you have a will and um, you state who gets what and nobody's fighting, well, you still have to go to court and go through a legal process called probate. A lot of people think that, oh, if I have a will, I can avoid probate, but that's not true. Uh, even with the will, and even if your beneficiaries are not fighting, you still have to go to probate. So what is probate? Well, it's a legal process where the estate of a descendant is administered. So it's kind of look like this. Um, Probate is initiated by filing a petition. And in about three months or so, you have a hearing. I say three months, but it could be more than three months, especially now uh, with the COVID-19, um, um, the courts, San Diego courts were closed for over two months and uh, just resumed last week. So I've heard that there's a lot of backlogs and um, if you file a petition for probate today, I don't think you will get your first hearing in three months, maybe six months or more, I don't know. Anyway, once you file a petition, there are a list of things you need to do. Um, and then at the hearing, a personal representative will be appointed by the court. Personal representative, uh, if you have a will, is called a, an executor of your estate. 
And if you don't have a will, this personal representative is called the administrator of your estate. Uh, their jobs, their duties are the same, whether it's an executor or an administrator, they're both a uh, personal representative who would administer your estate, okay? Uh, once or until this personal representative is appointed by the court, there's not much you can do as to the decedent's estate. So if you have to wait three months or six months or more uh, for the first hearing, um, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> so then once the personal representative is appointed, um, there are things the, the personal representative must do. The first thing is to marshal the assets and make a list of decedent's assets and debts. And also you need to have an appraisal. How much did the decedent own at the time of his or her death? Well, bank accounts are easy. All you need is a bank statement, but what if you have a real property or a business or stock? Well, those needs to be appraised and those needs to be appraised by uh, someone called probate referee. You can't just Google and you know, look up on Zillow how much this house is worth. You have to go through a probate referee in order to get an appraisal. Now, it can take time and it's not free, okay? By the way, it costs money to file a petition. You have to spend money to uh, place a notice um, in the newspaper, that costs money too. Sometimes the bond is required, costs money. Um, if you have a house to sell, um, you have to go through uh, some formalities. Uh, let's say the market value of the house um, is uh, $500,000. You can't sell it for $300,000 because you wanted to get rid of it quick. You have to get the consent from all beneficiaries that, look, um, the house is worth about $500,000, but I want to sell it for $300,000. Are you guys okay with that? If somebody, if the beneficiary objects, then you can't sell it. All right, and then um, you have to file last tax returns and do a formal accounting, which means you have to hire a CPA and cost more money. Um, once the accounting is approved by the court, then you can finally file a, um, we have to ask the court for final distribution you have to have an okay from the court before you can actually distribute the money to the beneficiary. So the earlier example that I gave, uh, grandma died in January of 2018. Uh, we initiate, initiated the probate process and I just made the distribution to the beneficiaries December of 2019. So the entire 2018 passed and 2019, so two years. Is this case closed? Um, unfortunately, not yet. Um, I'm hoping it will be over soon, but again, the court was closed uh, for several weeks, so I don't know when it, will be, when it would be uh, finished. So it is still ongoing. So it's been more than two years since I initiated the probate. Um, Probate is time consuming. Now this example that took more than, that is taking more than two years, this is a simple straightforward case. Uh, the grandma only had a house and a bank account, a checking and savings account, that's it. It's uncontested, nobody's fighting for anything. So this is a relatively straightforward, simple case, but still is taking more than two years. Now, it is also very expensive. And this is an example of actual case um, that we just talked about. So between the house and few money cash, um, cash um, in bank account, the total asset value was $405,000. And again, it was appraised by the probate referee and that was the actual amount. Um, well, this grandma had some last expenses like medical bills and credit card bills. We had to pay that off first. And after that, this is the amount she had, which the beneficiaries expected to receive. 
However, because we're in probate, there are expenses to be paid. And in this case, it was almost $20,000 uh, in probate expenses. And of course, uh, the uh, attorney's compensation, and that is the actual fee that I received. And also the personal representative is entitled to the same amount as the attorney. So think about it, attorney fee times two, double. So between the, um, our compensation and the probate cost, you spent, in this case, we spent about uh, more than $41,000 in probate. That's a lot of money. And again, this um, numbers we're looking at is the actual number and it's not a secret. Um, it's a public document that you can actually be online from the court's website. Uh, probate is something you should avoid because you can. There's no privacy. It takes too much time and it costs a lot of money. Basically, more for us, less for you. That's probate. Um, this is just as a reference. So the attorney's fees in California, uh, it's set by the statute. It's set by the percentage like this. And sometimes we can ask for extraordinary work fee. Um, if the judge approves, we can uh, get more than the statutory fee. So think of the statutory fee as the minimum attorney's fee and there are other expenses. Now, again, the personal representative is entitled to the same amount as the statutory attorney fee. So you can um, imagine uh, double attorney's fee. Okay. So do you always have to go through probate if you die um, with or without will? Well, if your gross uh, estate value exceeds $166,250, yes. Uh, this number used to be 150000 until last year, but effective January 1st, 2020, the amount is this. Now, even if you have a will, and even if no one is fighting over your estate, you still have to go to probate if your gross estate exceeds this much, right? But what if you don't have this much? Well, you don't have to go to probate process, but you will still have to get an affidavit of small estate to actually inherit the asset. And there are exceptions to probate. For example, uh, any assets held in joint tenancy with rights of survivorship avoids probate. Assets with beneficiary designation avoids probate. But you have to be careful uh, because both of these methods, the pros are that you avoid probate. That's great, that's wonderful. But there are cons as well. Uh, for example, in the earlier, um, earlier example that I gave you, um, if, if you have, uh, if your husband and wife and own the property uh, jointly uh, between husband and wife, if one dies and the other inherits without probate, but what if you're, you're still living, you're both living, but one is not so lively anymore, then what? Um, you won't be able to sell the house, you won't be able to refinance the house, uh, it can be problems. So be careful when you uh, try to avoid probate by having everything in joint tenancy or just by designating a, a beneficiary. There are pros and cons to that. Now with joint tenancy, uh, I have a lot of clients who ask, um, well, what, you know, I own the house and I want to um, just change the title to my son at this point or add my daughter's name as joint tenancy. Would that be a good idea? Um, be careful because those are considered gifts and uh, it triggers taxable event. So you have to be really careful. Now, assets held in a trust also avoids probate. And I'm going to talk about, uh, there's different types of trust, but I'm going to talk about uh, a trust called a revocable inter vivos trust and it is commonly known as a living trust. So how does it work? Now, here we are, individual. As a person, you might own a house or bank account or any cash assets. And remember we talked about will. In this will, you're going to um, state who gets what 
upon your death, right? When you die, everything goes to the beneficiary, but who gets what? That's will. But we also talked about uh, probate. Well, if your assets, the gross value of your estate exceeds $166,250, then even if you have a will, this will have to go to probate. So instead of a will, you would create a, a trust agreement. It's a document like a will. Now you create, you draft this document and you sign. Then voila, you have a trust, okay? But imagine in your head that you prepare this document and you sign it and you have this trust and imagine the trust as an empty box, like a box. Once you create this empty box, what you need to do is to transfer your assets to the trust. This is called the funding of the trust. Funding, oops. Funding of the trust. If you don't fund it, trust agreement is just a piece of paper. Now, once you transfer your assets into your trust, in this box, who owns them? Are they still your assets? And the answer is yes, because these are uh, owned by the trustee. And you who create the trust agreement becomes the initial trustee of your trust. Initial, initial trustee. Now in this trust agreement, you're going to state who, what happens to these assets in the trust. Who gets what upon your death? So it's kind of like a will. It states who gets what. So upon your death, um, it goes to your beneficiaries. But who would actually um, administer that? Well, it is your successor trustee. Oops. Uh, in this document, you will designate your successor trustee. Successor trustee is someone who will take over your position as a trustee upon your incapacity or, or, your, or your death. Remember in a will, you had an executor who needed to be appointed by the court in order to administer your estate? In the trust agreement, you can actually appoint your successor trustee and that successor trustee did not have to go to court to be appointed. Now, in this trust agreement, you're going to state in detail who gets what and how. So this successor trustee will follow your instructions and distribute the assets to your beneficiaries upon your death. Okay. Now, upon your death, look, you don't have anything because you funded or you transferred your assets to the trust, which means there's not, nothing to probate. Probate process only applies to assets owned by individuals. Trust is regarded as an entity. So when the assets are left in the entity, the probate is not applicable because trust is an entity, right? So living trust is uh, officially known as a revocable intervivals trust, but we call them living trust or family trust. Um, to, to establish one, you will prepare and sign a trust agreement. And then in this document, you would appoint a trustee. You are the first trustee, or let's say initial trustee. But you also want to appoint your successor trustee to take over the position upon your incapacity or death. And again, you want to name your beneficiary who gets what and how and you can be as detailed as you like. And I think it should be detailed as possible. Um, I don't want you to say, well, everything goes to my children. Well, define children. And what if you have a house, just one house, and they don't, your children don't agree on how to um, inherit the property. Maybe you want, might want to sell the house to get cash. One might want to live in it or um, rent it out as an investment property? What, what if there are disputes between the beneficiaries? 
To avoid that, I recommend you be specific as possible who gets what and how. Now, once you have the trust document, just imagine it's still an empty box. You need to fund your trust. I think a trust that is not funded is just a piece of paper. It's meaningless, okay? Now, the actual um, trust document, the contents of it, it really um, is different between yours and your neighbors. I mean, think about it. You have different family structure. Uh, you might be single, married, divorced, uh, remarried with um, mixed family, mixed family structure. You have different assets. Um, and of course, your wishes are different. So everyone's trust agreement should look different. Uh, that's why I don't usually recommend using those uh, filling the blank cookie cutter um, trust agreement. It may work for someone, but it may not work for you. So be careful. Um, and when you create a trust, please do not forget to fund your trust. And if you forget, there is something called pour over will. And we usually prepare the pour over will um, if you uh, want to do a, a trust agreement with us. And it's a special type of will. And this will doesn't really specify who gets what. This uh, special will just simply states that I have a trust and I intend it to um, transfer my assets to the trust, but I forgot, oops, I forgot. So please pour everything over to the trust and distribute the assets from the trust. So it's, it's a special type of will called pour of a will, usually um, prepare with the trust agreement. This is just a backup document. Because it's a will, you will still have to go to probate, a court, um, but you don't have to go through the probate process, uh, just as a backup document. Now, we talked about advanced healthcare directive and durable power of attorney. I truly believe that these are documents that you should have regardless of your um, age or wealth because unexpected accidents and illness could happen to anyone, really regardless of your age. So if you're over 18 years old, you should consider having at least the Advanced Healthcare Directive and Durable Power Attorney. And the good news is in California, there is an approved statutory form available online for free. And um, I'll give you the, the link to it. If you have a smartphone, you can take a, a picture of that uh, QR code and that form will pop up on your uh, screen. So this is for the Advanced Healthcare Directive, and this is for the Durable Power Attorney, and they are statutory forms. Now, I have to say, these are legal forms, so if you don't know how to complete, um, or if you're not sure, please go get a, a legal advice from a qualified professional. I do not usually like to advise people to hear, here's a form, it's fill in the blank. I don't wanna do that, but just, you know, to let you know that these resources are available out there. Um, but if you can, uh, you should seek an advice of a qualified legal professional, all right? For a living trust, um, I, I do not recommend using a uh, filling the blank form because um, just having a document doesn't mean that you're protected. It has to be carefully uh, written and analyzed. So if you're interested in private consultation um, at Santa and Associate, we do require appointments and we do not uh, offer free consultation. It's always uh, $300 for about 60 minutes. But if you decide to retain our firm to uh, assist you with estate planning, we credit your $300 towards your estate plan fees. Now you can go to our website to make an appointment or you can simply scan this QR code uh, on your smartphone. Right now, we uh, recommend Zoom meeting. Uh, if you're watching this live, you're using Zoom, so I know you can use Zoom. Uh, if you like to meet in person, we are uh, taking appointments at our Carlsbad main office. And if you can't come to our office, uh, I, we do have a travel service that we come to your home. However, there'll be extra fee for that. All right, so. Again, this is the Durable Power Attorney and Advanced Healthcare Directive statutory forms, um, but I do highly recommend that you seek 
a proper legal advice from a qualified legal professionals. All right, um, that's it, everyone. But I think we have some time to answer your questions. Let's see. We have a few questions. Lisa, are you, did you want me to? Yes, did you want me to read um, some of these questions? Yes, see please. how many we can get to. Um, yes. Here's one from Griselda. She's asking, can the successor trustee be a beneficiary as well? Yes, absolutely. And it is not, it is actually common that your, um, uh, your child who is the beneficiary becomes a successor trustee. Yes, absolutely. And I like to know, um, I would only recommend naming one successor trustee at a time. Let's say you have three kids and you want to name the first one as the first successor trustee, but just in case that successor trustee doesn't want to do it or not able to do it, then you can actually name an alternate successor trustee and alternate, alternate. You can name as many as you want, but I do recommend having one person at a time. Did I answer that question? Here's another one from Kim. What's the best way to add a child born after execution of a trust to an estate plan? Okay, there are several ways to do it. Um, uh, when we do the estate plan, we actually include, we have, we, we use a language to cover all afterborn child into uh, your existing estate plan. But if you don't have that language, you can always amend the trust, restate the trust. There's two ways to um, rewrite your trust, amendment and restatement. Amendment to the trust uh, is just adding a page to the trust. So you have maybe 30 page trust agreement and if you amend it, you would amend a section of it and you would add that page to the original 30 page document. Now restatement is when you um, rewrite the whole document. So you will discard the original 30 page document and you would restate the whole thing and that's called the restatement. Um, either way is fine. Uh, but maybe you, you might want to take a look at your existing document and see if any um, afterborn child is included um, in the language. All right. So we have another question. Adrian is asking, Attorney Sano, what is your opinion on TOD? Uh, now, I'm not sure if you know what she means by that. I think she means the uh, transfer on death. Um, okay. TLD means transfer on death, and it could be um, added to uh, your uh, brokerage account, uh, transfer on death. It's like a POD, pay on death. And I'm not sure if she's talking about TOD on a real property. There is a thing called transfer on death deed. It's a specific deed to designate a beneficiary to your real property, um, to your house. Uh, I don't recommend it. It's relatively new in California. I think it was um, became effective in 2016 or 17. I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. Uh, I do not recommend it because there are too many um, issues uh, surrounding it. Uh, for example, the big one is that you can't really state um, conditions on the TODD. I'm assuming this person is asking about TODD. Um, it's a D that you put on the real property to name your beneficiary. You can't any, uh, put specify any condition, like um, I gave my property to my son if my son is uh, over the age of 18 or if my son is so-and-so. And one more thing is that a person who inherits the property also inherits your entire debt not just the mortgage on the house, but every debt you have, secure or unsecure, this beneficiary would have to, will be liable for your debt. So that's another thing. Um, I hope I answered that question. Next. Here's a couple of related questions. One is general and says, how does one fund her trust? And another one says, should you put your cars in the trust? So can you make some, um, Talk a little bit about funding the trust and whether cars should be a part of it. Okay, so 
to fund the trust, you have to um, retitle your assets. Let's say I created uh, my trust, living trust, called the, uh, the Sano Family Trust. That's the name of my trust, right? If I own a bank account or real property under my name, Ikuko Sano, I want to retitle the, uh, the name to the Sano Family Trust. So uh, the actual account title to your bank account will be the Sano Family Trust. And I am the signer because I am the trustee uh, for the real property. The title will be Ikuko Sano as trustee of the Sano Family Trust. But you have to actually um, file a, a deed called tr trust transfer deed in order to change the title on the real property. For bank accounts, you have to actually go to the bank and retitle. Um, at Santa and Associate, we, we provide funding support. So after you sign the trust agreement, we always help you with funding process. Um, because again, trust that is not funded is just a piece of paper and it's a waste. So we always help you. And um, depending on the actual asset, it, sometimes it is tricky um, to, to fund it, you, to retitle it. Um, I have my associate attorney always um, doing research how to fund this particular um, property. Um, cars, you, you can put the car in the trust, but it is not needed and it's, I, it's not recommended. I don't recommend your um, everyday car into your trust because car is easy to transfer upon your death. Uh, it's, a, it's a process that you do at DNB and there are forms that DNB provides. Um, and I've, I've heard about an um, incident where my colleague's client um, retitled the car into the trust and when he got in, the client got into an accident and the insurance company had some issue uh, paying out because according to the insurance company uh, the car was owned by the trust but the the client was personally insured and the trust was not insured um, it ultimately paid out but it was uh, paying in a um, you know what so you don't have to fund the, tr uh, fund the car into your trust. However, I do have a client who owns a very, very expensive classic car. Um, and that car, I recommended that he put it in the trust by uh, retitling the ownership to the trust and registering under the name of the trust. Did I answer that? Okay, next question. Another question. This one's a little complicated, but maybe you can touch on it. What if an elderly person becomes only partially incapacitated and the person named as successor trustee places that elderly person in a living situation he or she does not want to be in? Do you have any general advice for that situation? Yes, that is a very um, difficult situation. Uh, partially incapacitated is always the most difficult one to handle because when you have dementia or Alzheimer, uh, you're, you still have the moment of clarity. Um, so sometimes they are doing fine, sometimes they're not. Uh, it is really up to the situation. Like I just did an estate plan for a 92 year old grandma and I was not sure if she had the capacity or not. So I sent her to, um, to a doctor to get a doc doctor's note uh, stating that she has or she does not have the capacity to uh, understand what's going on. Um, if she is uh, even partially incapacitated, uh, what was the question? I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> sorry. Um, it's if that person is then by the successor trustee put in a living situation they don't want to be in. Okay, so um, it really depends on the situation because the successor trustee may have done it for, for that client's best interest. Uh, maybe uh, the elderly uh, grandma does not want to be there at the moment, but maybe that is for her best interest. So in order to really uh, assess what is the best uh, interest of this grandma, it really depends on the, the surrounding situation, but this is a difficult one that I deal with um, a lot of times. All right, um, next question. Yes, what is the average cost to prepare? I think this means power of attorney and advanced uh, healthcare directive. 
along with a living will and trust if adding a home to the trust. So can you give a ballpark for that sort of basic package that this um, attendee is asking about? Okay, so I have to first say it all depends on the attorneys and law offices. Uh, we all have different um, fee structure, so I can't speak for other attorneys, but um, at Santa Associate, um, it really uh, we do offer a complete estate plan package, which includes the durable power of attorney, advanced healthcare directive, living trust, and a portable will, and that comes with um, funding support. And for real property, we do the funding, um, meaning we prepare the deed, you sign it, we record it, we pay for the recording fee. Um, so the whole complete package, it really depends whether you're single or married or have how many houses you own. Um, so I can't really tell you exactly how much it's going to be, but you can um, expect about for the complete plan about 3,000 for a single person and about 4,000 for a married couple. Uh, and again, if you own business or own multiple properties, uh, there will be additional fees. So um, if you're interested, uh, we always discuss the uh, fee at initial consultation because I need more information from you to actually tell you exactly how much it's going to be. But we do flat fees. We don't charge by the hour because we want you to ask as many questions as you want. Um, it's a very important planning that you're doing, and I don't want you to Google your questions because you're afraid that you'll be billed for my time. <laughs> so we do flat fees and we do present your the quote at the um, initial private consultation. So if you're interested, um, please sign up for the consultation. And again, if you decide to retain us, we credit that $300 towards your estate plan fees. All right. So we've got just a few more minutes. I'll try to um, get to another couple of questions for you, Hariku. Um, here, Kathleen is asking, what is the difference between revocable and irrevocable? And also, may the successor of the trust be the designated durable power of attorney and healthcare designee as well? Sort of a variation on that earlier question. Okay, so irrevocable and revocable trust a completely different type of trust. Now, uh, we talked about living trust today. Living trust is a revocable trust, meaning once you um, create it, it is amendable, it is revocable, like you can revoke it, terminate it, close it. Um, anything that you put in the revocable trust is considered as your assets as long as you're living. Irrevocable trust, on the other hand, is once you create the trust, it's regarded as an entity, and whatever the asset you put in the irrevocable, irrevocable, irrevocable trust is not considered your assets. So um, in an irrevocable trust situation, let's say you put the house in it, uh, it's not your house anymore, basically. But um, this irrevocable trust is used for tax saving planning. Um, oftentimes with people with large wealth want to utilize irrevocable trust to minimize the estate tax and other taxes. Um, so there's a big difference between irrevocable and irrevocable. Uh, for probate avoidance, you want to use revocable trust because you would want your asset, you would want to use and own your asset while you're living, right? So um, big difference between irrevocable and irrevocable. Now, the second question was, um, can the successor trustee be the same person as agents um, under the power of attorneys? Yes, absolutely. Uh, typically, yes, um, you will appoint the same person, especially the trustee and the durable power of attorney. Uh, if it's the same person, it's, um, it's very convenient. Um, and yes, that person can be a healthcare uh, agent. Um, Typically for husband and wife, your spouse becomes the agent and successor trustee. I'm sorry, um, your, that's not true. Your agent um, is your spouse. And um, if you're married and you have a joint living trust, both of you, husband and wife, are the initial trustees. Now, when one of you um, becomes incapacitated or die, then the survivor of you becomes the, the sole initial trustee. And then you will appoint um, successor trustee that takes place after the second spouse's uh, incapacity or death. Did I answer that? 
Okay, I hope I answered I answer that question. Um, can we take one more question maybe? No? We did have an attendee asking about if someone doesn't have a family member to act for them, what are your recommendations on the process for finding someone to um, someone to represent them? Are there qualifications? Is there a process for doing this? Um, and this attendee would like to do this while they still have the capacity to do so. Yes, if you don't have anyone uh, that you can trust and you can rely on, I do recommend using a licensed professional fiduciary and you can find them online. Um, if you go to the Secretary of State website, all the licensed um, fiduciaries are listed. Um, and of course, uh, we have some fiduciaries that we work with that I can recommend to you. Um, and I, I suggest that you talk to several um, fiduciaries um, and get to know them so you can choose which one is, you know, you have the personal fit. Um, so, but I do have several um, fiduciaries that I work with that I recommend. All right. I hope I answered the question. Well, I think we're out of time. Is there anything you want to say to wrap, wrap, wrap up today? Uh, no, well, thank you very much uh, for your time today, and I hope um, what we discussed today is useful and that you are start planning before it's too late. All right, everyone, please stay safe and healthy. Bye. Thank you, and this is Lisa from the library. Again, please take our survey if you have a moment after you sign off today. Thanks so much for attending our webinar. Thank you. Bye.